Let me ask you a question. As you listen to Ephesians 4, who is that written to? Meaning, don't tell me the Ephesians, because you're right. But who is that written to? Was that written to non-believers or to believers? Was that written to people outside of the church or inside of the church? Inside the church. Wow. That's pretty touchy-feely. Inside the church. That tells you the early church, some of the problems that they were having in the early church. Sometimes we romanticize and think the early church is the place that you that I would want to be, that you'd want to be, if we could just have church like back then, that's when it was really good. Because the apostles were there. Jesus was just days or years from being there. Wow. Those were the golden ages of the church. Hmm. The reality is the church is the church is the church. They have the same situations that we have today. That's what makes this book so relevant. And that's why it's so important for us to listen to today. So join me as we go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you for our time together. We thank you, Lord, that as you speak from your word, you are still speaking to us 2,000 years later, your message is important for us to hear and to obey and to apply into our lives. As much as it was for the Ephesians or for the Romans or the Galatians or whoever that particular letter was directed to, as believers in Christ, we are experiencing the same problems that the first Christians were, are facing or were facing. We're find ourselves with the same struggles. And we need your help, just like they did. So this morning, Lord, we're asking for your enlightenment, mercy. Lord, we thank you for your grace. In Jesus' name, amen. For some people, it seems like kind that being kind comes naturally. Yet for most of us, being kind to others needs to be developed. Regardless of our disposition, we are told in Scripture that the Spirit of God wants to develop kindness in our lives, like fruit on a tree. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, pay, uh, peace, patience, gentleness, which is another word for kindness. I like, I like what... Uh, Juanita Purcell said, concerning kindness, this wicked world is difficult enough without the turmoil caused by sour, unkind people. A little kindness goes a long way in, smoothly, in smoothing, touchy situations and prickly people. Our kindness can add a touch of joy in an unhappy world. I wish to draw our attention this morning to two different passages. Both speak about being kind to one another. One speaks about our, our being kind to one another in regards to our priority in our relationships to one another. The second passage talks about our function of being kind to one another. So the first one we're going to deal with is our relationship, being kind to one another in the relationship. The second is the function of being kind to one another. So what we're going to deal with is first relation, and then the function of it. There's a priority of kindness, which we'll take a look at here first. If I can get all my technical gadgets moving and working. There we go. The priority of kindness in our relationship. Now, I'm going to ask you to turn to Romans chapter 12, verse 10. Although the scripture reading was from Ephesians, which is a great passage, we're first going to start off in Romans chapter 10. Because once you get to Romans chapter 12, you're looking at, you know Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. You do probably perhaps, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, 
based upon chapters 1 all the way to chapter 11, you know that based upon these facts, the Apostle Paul is now asking the brother, I want you to behave this way, which is your reasonable service, which is what you should do because of all these great things that Jesus Christ has done for you. You should now, and I'm begging you, by the way, the Apostle Paul is on his hands and knees, he's begging his brothers and sisters in Christ to act this way. That you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your rational service. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is good and acceptable and the perfect will of God. He's talking to the church. He's telling Christians, here's how you are to behave. And he continues that same idea all the way down to verse 19. So I'm going to draw your attention to verse 10. And the New King James says, Be kindly affectionate to one another with brotherly love and honor, giving preference to one another. We've been talking about one another. There's two ideas of one another here. But I just want to draw your attention to be kindly affectionate to one another. Now, if you have an NIV, it says, it reads a little bit different. And it really depends on uh, when we're understanding the text. There's a different translation here. I'm going to see if I got this right. Mm, look at my notes. All right, all right. Okay. We'll see if we got this. When I'm looking at the text that's here, and I want you to see what's going on here. If you have an NIV, it's going to read something a little bit different. It's going to say something like this. Be devoted to one another in love. But the New King James says, be kindly affectionate. But if you have an ESV, it says, love one another with brotherly affection. Now, we've got three different translations, and they all say something a little bit different. And I didn't go in if anybody has a New American Standard or some of the other versions. But it's interesting that almost every version says something a little bit different. But you still get the same idea. There's a relationship that the Apostle Paul has established here by this term, brotherly love. Now, what city is known for its brotherly love? Philadelphia. That's really the Greek word. Philadelphia is the Greek word. Now, that means brotherly love, and we are thinking, okay, brotherly love is that love that is referred to with siblings, the love that brothers and sisters or brothers and brothers or sisters and sisters. It's that type of love that siblings have for one another in Christ. And he's referring it to the body, us. The kind of love that we're supposed to have in Christ towards one another. The term brother, eldelphoi, or adelphois, is used over 220 times throughout the New Testament. When he says brothers, brothers, bro that's that idea. And what's kind of interesting is that the essence of the word brother is found in the word Philadelphia. And the word brother really means this. Literally, it means from the same womb. Huh. A little interesting fact. So when we're talking about brothers, we're talking about those who are from the same womb. Brothers in Christ are those who belong to the same family. In Ephesians 2.19, he says, We are no longer strangers, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Earlier on in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5, it says God adopted us as sons through Christ Jesus. Paul uses the body illustration to picture that, Christ, that Christians are members of one another. The body meta metaphor that he uses emphasizes participation. participation in the body he also uses the family metaphor to emphasize a relationship so when we're looking at the text and we're trying to understand this we see that this relationship has been established paul saying be kindly affectionate to one another make sure that you are in the family of God, that we are, since we're all part of the, we're all in the same womb, we're all part of the same womb, we all belong in the same group, make sure that you are 
showing the right type of action towards each other. That you are, we'll say, kind, that you're devoted, that you are affectionate to each other, that you're showing family love, sibling love. Paul doesn't tell us how in this process. He just reminds everybody, hey, you guys are all part of the same body. Remember, you're part of a family. You belong together. Family is supposed to be strong. It's supposed to be together. It's not easily divided. There's no divorce in God's family. I'm not talking about on earth. I'm talking about Once you are in the family of God, God doesn't divorce you and kick you out, ever. Once you are adopted into the family of God, God does not say, but you have messed up, you have sinned so bad, I'm taking you out. God may take you out of the world, but he will never take you out of his family. That's something sometimes people get confused on. They they equate punishment with excommunication out of God's family. That's incorrect. God will punish his children for their wrongdoing, but God will never remove them from his family. In fact, the fact that he punishes us, the fact that he disciplines us, is part of the proof that he loves us, that he cares enough to step in and say, no, you can't do that anymore. That's not right. You don't get to do that anymore, and I'm finally going to tell you enough is enough. Being part of God's family means that you have a whole bunch of brothers and sisters. And they belong to God, too. And there's a need for kindness. See, people coming into the family of God are not spiritually changed overnight. Ontologically, they are, meaning Christ has changed their hearts. But let's be, let me be honest open and honest and real for a moment, which I'm supposed to be all the time, but I'm not, but neither are you. All my baggage wasn't evaporated and eliminated. When I walked through the door of getting saved by Jesus Christ, I was still Sean Hull that I was three seconds after accepting Christ. And you were the same person, too. You see, if you grew up unloved, unaccepted, with trust issues, habits based on lying, cheating, manipulation, values based on rationalism or or based on relativism, you're going to still carry those with you into your new Christian life. Because those are what you know. And when you come in the church and sit down at the pew, you're going to go, everyone else does the same thing, I guess. They're saved by Jesus, which is great. But that's what you do. That's what you know. See, when you come in to the church, you've got no idea of what it means to be a loving, caring Trusting brother or sister in Christ. Because you don't really know what those words are or what they mean. You've got the world's understanding of what they are, but they're all perverted and twisted. You don't know what God means until you sit and you start reading God's word and your mind is renewed and changed to see what it really means. And it takes time for your mind to change. Some people's minds change quicker than others. Gene Gates says, the family of God is to be a reparenting organism to bring emotional and spiritual healing to people who have grown up in an unhealthy family. I like that. Because I'm one of those. I grew up in an unhealthy family healthy family. And so coming into the church, it was the first time I got to see what does a healthy family 
look like. It wasn't because it was a church was filled with healthy people. It was the Word of God had the answers for what a healthy life looked like. When we love one another as Christ loves us, we are a model of a, what a new family life looks like. Can a church bring healing and health to people who have been thoroughly secularized? Yeah, I think so. I think it can, I think it has. But the real question is, all right, how? Oop, wrong button. First, they're not going to pop up on the screen. The answer's not going to pop up. I'm just going to, here's the first one. You can write these down. First, we have to find biblical instruction. Find biblical instruction. Take seriously what the Bible is saying about brotherly love. So I'm going to turn to some passages, and I just want you, you can write down the passages. You can read them later, but I'm going to read them just so you can notice what the Bible says about brotherly love. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. But concerning brotherly love, you have no need that I write to you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. And indeed, you do so, you do so towards all the brethren who are in Macedonia. But we urge you, brethren, that you increase even more. 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1. Verse 22. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 22. Since you have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit and sincere, and sincere love of the brethren, love one another fervently with a pure heart, having been born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible through the word of God, which lives and abides forever. Same book, but chapter 3, verse 8 and 9. Chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Finally, all of you be of one mind, having compassion for one another. Love as brothers. Be tenderhearted. Be courteous. Not returning evil for evil or reviling for reviling. But on the contrary, blessing. Knowing that you were called to this, that you may inherit a blessing. Go to 2 Peter. Chapter 1, verse 5. 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 5. But this also, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godless, uh, godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. The first thing that we need to do is find biblical instruction. Find it, what God's word says about the need for kindness, and take it seriously. These are just a few passages that I looked up and said, all right, here's what the Bible says. Do I believe this? Yeah, I do. Well, okay, if I believe it, then I come to my second thing. I need to develop an emotional connection. Well, Scripture also says in Romans chapter 12, verse 15, Rejoice with those who rejoice, and weep with those who, who weep. Some believers have a really hard time to connect with other believers at the feeling level. Is that fair to say? I think... Not all of us connect at that level. I know the Bible says to rejoice with others who rejoice, but not all of us can really rejoice if someone says, hey, I just got a new car. And we're like, oh, yeah, lucky you. <laughs> or some of us might say, um, my dog died. Oh, too bad. Go get another one. You know, it's, there's an emotional thing that we're not connecting with them on. 
And the Bible says, hey, you need to connect with somebody on an emotional level. And there's usually reasons we don't. Perhaps it's personal fear. We're afraid to open ourselves up because we've been hurt before. Maybe we've been hurt and we're afraid that if we open ourselves up because we've learned the lesson that if you get hurt, you're just going to get hurt again and again and again. But I want to remind you that if you have been hurt, the more you've been hurt, the greater your capacity is for love. Because the, as bad as you've been hurt, as deep as you've been hurt, the reverse is also true. You also have the great, that same capacity for love. One child was told by his grand, grandfather that he could never quite measure up. His grandfather would see him and he would say, hey, do you know what that is? And the grandson would say, no, I don't know what that is. He says, what's wrong with you? Are you stupid? What do they teach you in school? And the first time, it's just kind of one of those things. The second time, it's, eh. After a while, the grandson really wasn't so excited when Grandpa came in the door like, oh, Grandpa's here. It was like, eh, Grandpa's here. I don't really want to be around Grandpa. And so whenever there was an opportunity to shine and say, look, I got an A on the test or 100, it was, it was more of like, that's all you got? You can do better than that? And that attitude sort of stuck with him his whole life. It was sort of, he couldn't quite, measure up couldn't quite find the approval that hindered him it was a personal fear that stuck with him for his whole life and it caused him to not want to connect the second thing is maybe we've had poor family upbringing maybe you're part of a family who does not display affection Keep it bottled up, hidden inside. This can carry over into God's family. Maybe you grew up in a family where your dad or your mom never said they love you. Or they never expressed anything like that. And that can easily happen over to where you view God the Father, your father, the same way. God doesn't love me. doesn't say it. I don't say it. And you never really learn how to express the full range of emotions that you've been given properly. That's important to do, to be able to do. The third thing might be that's important for us to understand the need for kindness after we have searched scriptures, developed an emotional connection. We need to have deepening relationships because proper actions will strengthen relationships. When we do the right thing, when we act the right way, the feelings will come. Feelings will follow those right actions. Don't wait until you feel like it. Start with what you know to be right. For example, you may share a personal gift or a note of appreciation or invite someone to dinner or to an event. You may not have any feelings associated with it, but by doing these little things, the feelings will start to come. Expressing love in tangible ways will help you develop a feeling of love that you can express verbally. So that doesn't make any sense. I know it doesn't make any sense. But it will happen if you do these little steps. There are little acts that will turn into something more. So we move to, the, to our third, third point, or really the function of kindness in our relationships. We look at the relational aspect in the body, in our family, the need for it. What's the function of kindness in our relationships? Go to Ephesians 4. We want to understand kindness. Who is the first person that comes to mind 
when you think of kindness? All right, Jesus, okay. But who else besides Jesus, maybe? Who's the first person that comes to your mind when you think of kindness? Besides Jesus. Your mom, okay. Your youngest daughter, very nice. Anyone else? I'm going to, the, the first person that comes to my mind when I think of kindness is Grandma Jackson. Grandma Jackson was about four feet, maybe eight inches. I don't know if she was that tall. She was a round woman, short, as I mentioned. But during this time of the year, school started, of course, and we were in school. And every morning she would make me a bowl of cream of wheat. And I could see the butter swirling on top. And I could see the, the brown sugar swirling around top. And I could see milk swirling around top. And my cream of wheat was creamy. And it was in an orange bowl. I have no idea why I remember all these crazy things. But it was there on a TV dinner stand in a big chair in the living room. And my sister had oatmeal or something, and who knows. Uh, but... I had this, and every morning before school, she would have this ready for me with toast and milk and juice. She was my step-grandmother. It wasn't by blood. We could make cereal and everything else, but we lived above her in a home, and we would run down the stairs, and every morning she would have the cereal that we liked made for us. If I came home and was hungry, Grandma Jackson would make me something to eat. Not just, here's what we have, what would you like? Like act of kindness, little things. And I don't know why that sticks with me even today, but it does. That's the person I think of. It's the little things, hardly worth noting, that seems to mean, mean so much because it was directed towards, well, me. What's kindness? The dictionary says it's the quality of being friendly, generous, and considerate. It is synonymous with gentleness, concern, thoughtfulness, affection, warmth, compassion, sympathy, friendliness. When we look at Ephesians chapter 4, it says, and be kind to one another. The word there is Christos or Christoi. Now that may sound like very much like what the word we have for Christ. And it is very close to it. And it almost sounds like it when it's read. But the word there means to be useful. Literally, it means to be useful. So think of it this way. In function towards one another, kindness means to be useful to one another. And be useful to one another. And then someone once said, in order to, be, to demonstrate a spirit of kindness, we must move off the judgment seat and into the mercy seat. I like that. So how can I be useful to my brothers and sisters in Christ? That's a little bit different than thinking, Oh, i got to come up with a kind act or a kind deed. What can I do that's kind to somebody? How about thinking of it this way? What can I do that's useful to you? What can I do that's beneficial to you? What can I do that's helpful? Interesting, huh? Because if I'm useful to you, it is an act of kindness. What's the best environment for kindness to spread? When everything is going great? Hmm. Disaster? Difficult times? You're under pressure? Chaotic? It is interesting when Christ, 
when we get into our small go- groups, we'll have a chance to, to answer some of those and find out perhaps when is the best time for kindness to spread. But before we get there, let me ask you this. There's an example of kindness. And in the Bible, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, there is a wonderful example of kindness that is important for, for us to remember. I don't have time to go through and read this, but let me refresh your mind of who this is about. You recall that David had a best friend, and David's best friend was Jonathan. Jonathan, when Jonathan met David, you may not know this, Jonathan was older than David, perhaps as much as 10 years. David was just a young, young man, but Jonathan was already a warrior. And when he saw him, he saw something that he admired and he liked about him. And he recognized God's hand was upon him. And they were, hearts were knitted together. Good friends. Jonathan recognized something in David. He liked David. And David liked Jonathan. So much so that he was willing to protect him from his father, Saul. He was a little crazy, some of the things that he was doing. And it's trying to kill David, and he protected David. But David was going to rise up to be king. It was God's chosen, he was God's chosen man. At the time, Jonathan was the prince. Well, in one of the battles, Saul dies, and so does Jonathan. David hears this, and it cuts David to the heart. David is in tears. And eventually, some time has passed, and David establishes his kingdom. And in chapter 9, he remembers that relationship that he has with Jonathan. He says, is there any of the sons of Jonathan left? Because what happens when a new king comes into power? What happens to all the previous potential rivals they're usually killed and so David is on the hunt is there anybody left from Saul specifically from Jonathan's family line that David says he, that he might show kindness to that he, might, that he might express his love for Jonathan and there was one Mephibosheth Say that with me. Mephibosheth. Yeah, kind of fun. Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth was just a little boy. He was a cripple. They dropped him, and he broke his feet, really wasn't able to walk. And David said, you know what, Mephibosheth, when he found him, I want you to come into my house, and I want you to be part of my family. I want you to eat at my table. I want you to wear these clothes that I'm going to provide for you. In fact, I'm going to give you back all the land that your father had, and I'm going to restore all this to you. But for the rest of your days, I want you to eat with me. Because you're part of my family now. And in my family, we're together. That's an act of kindness. That's what kindness does. Acts of kindness soften people's heart. No matter how hard the heart is, an act of kindness will soften it. It was during the Korean War, a chaplain saw how seriously wounded a soldier was lying on the battlefield, and he rushed to his side and said, would you like me to read something from God's word to strengthen you? And the man lying there said, right now I'd rather have a drink of water. I'm so thirsty. The chaplain got up, ran off, and soon returned with water to quench the soldier's thirst. He took off his scarf, rolled it up, made a little pillow, and put it underneath his head. The man laid there and said, I'm so cold. The chaplain took off his jacket and laid it on top of the man to make sure that he was warm. The man whispered, now, if there's anything in that book, that makes you so kind, 
Please read it for me. Plan to do acts of kindness. Nothing big. Nothing suspendous, suspendous. Just little things that will count. Plan to do something for your family. Plan to do something for somebody in this church, in this body. Plan to do an act of kind, kindness. Not from the time that you leave your seat to go to your car, but from Monday to next Sunday. It might be a card, it might be a postcard, it might be a phone call, it might be a text. I don't know what it will be. Maybe you're going to go over and mow someone's lawn. I don't know. You figure it out. But plan some, some sort of act of kindness for one another here. Let me end with this. Let me be a little kinder. Let me be a little blinder to the faults of those about me. Let me praise a little more. Let me be a little meeker with the brother that is weaker. Let me think more of my brother and a little less of me. Father, Lord, we just thank you for our time together this morning. We reflect about the importance of being kind to one another. May our attention be drawn away from ourselves in our obedience to you. May we step out and begin to show our obedience by our actions. We pray for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.